Re presiding officer that I would be delighted to visit his constituency and to see the good work that SSE is doing uh, in this regard. Very good. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13203 in the name of Jackie Bailey on the future of Scotland's economy. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move the motion. 14 minutes, Ms Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today, Scotland remains a deeply unequal country, and that has a direct impact on our economy. Our objective to boost the economy at the same time as tackling inequality is an ambition I believe shared across all of this chamber, including the Scottish Government. There is no doubt that recent times have been tough for businesses across the country, whether you are in a large or a small business, in manufacturing or retail, in urban or rural Scotland, the economic downturn has had an impact. Markets were tighter, turnover declined, and the workforce contracted. In short, the economy struggled, businesses suffered, and working people experienced the worst cost of living crisis in decades. Things are beginning to improve. The economy is showing signs of growth. Employment is increasing and confidence is starting to improve too. But the most recent quarter shows a marked slowing down in that growth. So whilst I want to recognise the achievements of our businesses in growing our economy, we equally need to recognise that we have nothing to be complacent about. Despite the growth, the recovery is not shared by everyone who is in work. Too many people are caught in one of the worst cost of living crises in decades. There is continuing uncertainty with zero hours contracts, low wages and underemployment. And that matters if we are to address inequality, because it's not just a matter of fairness, it is also an economic issue. The Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the International Monetary Fund and others point out that countries that have relatively high degrees of wealth and income inequality have lower levels of economic growth. It is therefore, in a second, it is therefore in the interest of us all to address the issue. Mark McDonald. Our economy... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm happy to give way at this point, if that helps. Mark sorry, McDonald, I was, I was perfectly happy to wait, but, uh, <laughs> but thank you to the member for giving way. I wonder if the member has had an opportunity to consider the call from the STUC for us to look again at whether or not uh, powers over employment, for example, around minimum wage and other and, uh, terms and conditions should be included within the package of powers that are to be devolved to this parliament, uh, given the circumstances that have arisen uh, in the recent general election. Jackie Bailey. Thank the member for his intervention. Um, we, of course, have an opportunity tomorrow to debate the full devolution package. So I look forward, because I'll be speaking then, to engaging with him in more substance on that issue. But our economy does need to be rebalanced so that when we talk about the number of jobs created, we aren't simply counting temporary, low-paid, zero-hours contract jobs in our country. And we know that much of the vaunted recent rise in employment figures is almost entirely down to an increase in part-time, low-paid, temporary jobs. Just this week, we saw the BBC reveal that only 10 of Scotland's 50 largest employers pay the living wage. Last week, a major employer, perhaps renowned for offering low-paid jobs, low-security work, saw the value of their shares rocket when the Tories secured their majority. So this Parliament is not a place to sit on our hands and moan about the UK Tory government, although I confess there will be lots of scope because there will be areas where we fundamentally disagree with them. But the SNP promise in the general election was about securing a stronger voice for Scotland at Westminster. Our mantra in here surely is about securing a stronger voice for fairness and social justice for the people of Scotland in this Parliament. Because Scotland could have led the way in promoting better pay, in banning exploitative zero-hours contracts in the Procurement Reform Bill just last year. But unfortunately, as we all know, the SNP joined with the Conservatives to vote against Scottish Labour plans for better pay and for security of hours for workers, cleaners, carers and retail staff. They didn't just do it once, they voted against it five times. So it is about using the power you already have. Now I have heard the Scottish Government demand the devolution of job creating powers for this Parliament. And I support a powerhouse parliament that's able to tackle inequality, to pursue social justice. But, you know, many of the powers that we need for economic development are already with this parliament. 
So I want to urge the SNP to use them now to tackle the inequality that hampers our economy and that hampers the life chances of too many people. Because OECD research has shown that inequality has cost Scotland an estimated 8.5% of GDP over the past 25 years. So we know a fairer economy means a better economy. We all have a better chance of success if we all have the same opportunities to succeed. Inequality stifles economic growth, so we all want a strong and prosperous economy, but one in which all share in that prosperity. And on the basis that the member has a loud voice, I'll let him in. Evan Stewart. Here was me thinking I was meek and mild, presiding officer. Um, in terms of inequality, does Ms Bailey agree with me that we should have welfare powers in this parliament rather than seeing the constant cuts that are coming from Westminster, which are having a major effect in creating a more unequal society in Scotland? Thank you, Bailey. Um, the record continues in the same groove, presiding officer. I would have more respect for the member's position if we actually worked together to use the powers we have now that could actually make a real difference to people rather than putting it off to some point in the future. But, you know, we need to create the opportunities to recalibrate our economy in the long term by making the best investment any government can make, and that is in our people. Presiding officer, you don't just need to take my word for it. Um, a very famous economist, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, proposed three solutions to inequality in his book, The Great Divide, Unequal Societies, and What We Can Do About Them. Well, surprise, surprise, the third solution is education. Education is much more than a social policy. It should be part of any government's strategy for long-term economic development. But, you know, despite having full control over education for nearly a decade, the SNP's track record on it, especially in attainment, is a national scandal. Now, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's tone and comments from her lecture last night where she admitted that the Scottish Government should be doing much better in education, and we will work with her to improve education in Scotland. But, presiding officer, it was, of course, the First Minister herself who said that a party in its second term of office cannot avoid taking responsibility for its own failings. In educational attainment, the failings are severe. We are failing our young people as a consequence. The number of young people in Scotland gaining national three to five qualifications dropped by 20% in a year. That's over 100,000 fewer young people getting the grades they need to get on in life. Under the SNP, we have seen literacy levels in primary and secondary school fall at every stage surveyed. Now they're shaking their heads. I didn't make this up. These are facts from surveys undertaken. These are the government's own figures. And under the SNP, the proportion of pupils performing well or very well in reading fell from 2012 to 2014. These declines in performance can be seen at every stage, primary four, primary second, seven, the second year of high school. But at every stage, we see pupils from the most well-off backgrounds with higher performance than pupils in the middle and most deprived backgrounds. That should be a concern to us all. But let me, presiding officer, put this in context, because the proportion of second-year high school pupils from the poorest backgrounds performing well or very well at numeracy was a mere 25 per cent. That should shame us all. And let's be clear what this means. This means that under this SNP government, Scotland's children, especially those from the most deprived backgrounds, are not getting even the most basic of skills. Our children's ability to read, to write, to count has all gone backward under the SNP. And it is without question a national scandal. We cannot simply pay lip service to this and say how bad it is and the Scottish Government really must take action because actually this matters not to just those individuals, it matters to the future state of our economy. The Education Secretary said she planned to take stock after six months on the job. And whilst I welcome this, let me say as gently as I can that her government has been in power for eight years. Taking stock after six months is not enough. All of these failures, all of this regression, all of this denied opportunity has been taking place on the SNP's watch. Presiding officer, there is a general pattern that emerges when this government is held to account on its record. And it is our responsibility in this chamber to do so. 
But I recall opponents often accused of talking down Scotland, or they use the wor those that work in that particular service under scrutiny as some kind of human shield. But let me be clear, when I point out the problems we have in education in this country, I'm not blaming teachers, I'm not blaming students, I'm not even blaming parents, because the blame lies squarely at the door of this SNP government. Today, Today, teacher numbers are at a 10-year low, with over 4,000 fewer teachers in Scotland's classrooms since the SNP came to power. The 2007 manifesto promise to cut class sizes has been completely abandoned. It is therefore little wonder that we have gone backwards. Presiding officer, closing the attainment gap in education will have a long-term benefit to our economy. Lower attainers are more likely to be unemployed, working part-time, earning less. Those earnings are substantially less, more than £20 a week for men, more than £40 a week for women. That is why Scottish Labour considers that closing the attainment gap should be Scotland's number one priority, because this is good for individual people and it's good for our economy too. We want to see overall attainment rise. That should be the ambition of the government, especially in the areas of literacy and numeracy where we have failed so badly so far. Presiding officer, our proposal is to close that attainment gap with 25 million per year of extra investment in our education system, 125 million over the period of the parliament. That extra investment we would use to double the number of teaching assistants, to employ 200 literacy teachers and focus their work in the communities with the 20 secondary schools and their associated primary schools where working class kids have been most left behind by the SNP government. We're committed to raising the performance of the lowest 20% achieving pupils wherever they study. And we will support the parents of these children to ensure they have the reading and writing skills they need to support their children. These are the choices, presiding officer, we would make. Happy to give way. Stuart Stevenson. Can the member uh, to inform my speech later uh, give me the cost of employing a literacy teacher and the cost of employing a classroom assistant? Thank you, Bailey. I'm happy to tell you that a classroom assistant, I'm being advised, is £20,000. Um, and we think 30 for a literacy teacher, but I'm happy to confirm that in writing to the member afterwards. Can I also indicate to the member that as a result of his intervention, we have placed at the back of the chamber um, a table which gives it... I don't think he's listening. The member is clearly not interested in the debate. Presiding officer, for your benefit, we've placed a table in the back of the chamber to which the member referred to in his earlier point of order. But those are the choices we would make, presiding officer. I don't need to remind anyone in this chamber that the language of priorities is indeed the religion of socialism. We would make these changes by using the new powers coming to the Scottish Parliament to introduce a new top rate of tax at 50 pence in the pound. This investment is not just, I need to make progress, this investment is not just in our most disadvantaged pupils to get a better start in life, it is an investment in the future strength of our economy. It is right that those with the broadest shoulders should pay a little more to deliver the investment that Scotland needs to be a fairer nation. After all, that is what progressive politics is all about. Before the general election, the SNP adopted swathes of Labour policies. They wrapped themselves in the red flag. The mansion tax, the banker's bonus, and the 50 pence rate of income tax, which through the Smith Agreement, they will have the power to deliver on that pledge soon enough. Presiding officer, I note the government amendment today removes any mention of using the 50 pence rate to invest in our education system and improve attainment. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why that is? Are the SNP about to backtrack on fair taxes. Only a few months ago, SNP MSPs in this chamber voted against using a higher rate of tax to invest in our education system. Yet within weeks, we saw an SNP manifesto backing the move. So which is it? Presiding officer, Scottish Labour is clear. We will use fair taxes to close the attainment gap in this country. We believe in progressive politics. We'll build a fairer Scotland and a stronger economy in doing so. Thank you,
before I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move Amendment 13203.3, can I just invite members to press the request to speak buttons if they wish to take part in the debate. Now call on Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome this opportunity to um, debate in tandem uh, education, our economy and inequality and how we're going to tackle it, because they are all inextricably uh, linked. And of course, it's this government that has done more than any past or previous administration in the UK to promote the living wage. And it is clear to all of us, and it is clear, it is clear uh, to me, presiding officer, that all of us in this chamber do share a commitment to tackling inequality and at times its devastating impact on our society and our economy. And it is important to remember that we are not just talking about an abstract, but real lives and our children's future. And if we put the interests and needs of our children at the heart of our debate, then I hope that we can find some agreement and more ways of generating light eh, rather than heat on such a vital issue. Not quite just yet, Mr Finlay. I do, however, want to address the errors in Labour's assertion about young people's achievements in examinations in recent years. In First Minister's question time last Thursday, Ms Dugdale claimed that recent research showed, I quote, 102,000 fewer candidates getting the grades that they need to get on in life. This, presiding officer, is simply not the case, given that in any year there are only ever around 150,000 candidates presenting for qualifications. And Labour appears to have confused the number of candidates with the number of entries for examination. Yet everyone knows most candidates are presented for several qualifications in a moment. And the Scottish Qualifications Authority own data shows that total entries and passes at levels three to five, as expected, did drop last year, but not because, but not because of failure, but because of success. Because our young people, supported by teachers and education authorities, have successfully transferred to the new system in line with changed curriculum models, whereby they take fewer qualifications in S4. This is well known and does not reflect the performance at exams of our young people, nor does it reflect on the system itself. Yes. Elizabeth Smith. Uh, thank you. I think the Cabinet Secretary is correct in her assessment about the number of presentations is that not in itself one of the key issues in that fewer presentations are being made because of the change to the exam system and that has knock-on effects to hires and advanced hires and the concerns of parents are that they will actually end up with fewer qualifications even although the existing ones might actually be quite well taken. Angela Constance. I think what Ms um, Smith is failing to understand that the overall purpose um, of the curricular reforms is to maximise performance of children by the time that they leave school. And the reasons for the changes are indeed related to the curriculum. And I do wonder at times whether uh, both the Conservatives and the Labour benches, whether they remain absolute in their commitment uh, to supporting curriculum for excellence. Because in the new arrangements, pupils do an extra year of what we call broad general uh, education, something I thought we all understood. And under Curriculum for Excellence, children maintain a full range of subjects through to S3, and they only begin to drop subjects then, typically focusing on a smaller number of formal qualifications in the course of S4. They then go on into S5, able to focus in depth on the subjects that they have continued studying. Now, a small percentage of young people still leave... Uh, OK. okay. Um, I, I don't accept some of the analysis the Cabinet Secretary has presented in, in closing the debate. I'll try and address some of that. But just on that particular point, uh, those uh, pupils, of course, will only be able to proceed to higher in the fewer subjects which they have studied if they pass those subjects. The same SQA statistics that she is quoting show that for levels three to five, the pass rate dropped from 92% to 83%. And at level five, credit, what was credit level, to below 80%, 79%. 
Attainment has fallen. Yeah. Of course, more young people took and sat hires. And what Mr Gray, I think, is failing to realise is that the new qualifications, the new qualifications is a shift towards deeper learning, where we have more analysis, engagement and understanding, where pupils generally study a wider range of subjects, as I said, at S3, and focus on a smaller number of qualifications at S4 on their way to studying hires. Now, of course, no, no, thank you. Of course, we know that a small percentage of young people still leave school at the end of S4. And under Curriculum for Excellence, they will do so with a firm foundation. And the percentage of young people leaving school with no qualifications has reduced drastically in recent years, further and faster than under Labour, and now stands at 1.5%. And I think it's really sad that the Labour Party have chosen to um, misrepresent Dr yeah. Scott's painstaking collection of data and I think as we go through the official record uh, I think people will be able to see that the facts uh, stand for themselves. So we have a record uh, to be proud of and I'll talk more about that in closing as well but we will absolutely not demure from the fact that much more, much more uh, needs to be done. And it is a pity that the benches uh, across here uh, won't recognise that where we can make useful comparisons is we can make comparisons between uh, hires taken in 2012-13 to 2013-14, uh, level six, which is mainly hires. And we have seen the total number of entries increasing from over 182,000 to over 191,000. And vitally, we are seeing the number of qualifications gained increasing from over 144,000 to over 148,000. And that's a record number, in fact. Presiding officer, I am totally committed to Curriculum for Excellence and its principles and approach to learning. Curriculum for Excellence will deliver the skills, knowledge and experiences we want to see for all our children and young people. Curriculum for Excellence is a success story that is still being written, no thanks. The OECD's review of our education system in 2007 praised our vision for Curriculum for Excellence. And the next review, the next review, which begins next month, will focus on the implementation and the broad general education to provide us with valuable, independent evidence drawn on the experience of other countries. Now, as Ms Bailey recognised last night, I set out my priorities, my values and my aspirations for Scotland's education system. And I want Scotland to have an education system that is fair and which provides excellence to all children, irrespective of their background or circumstances. An education system which does not settle for good enough, but aims high, giving children the skills that they need to thrive rather than simply survive. No, thank you. An education system which is focused on attainment and achievement, built around delivering equity and excellence, and crucially, aspiration and ambition. And already there are promising signs that we are on track to deliver excellence. 2012 PISA data shows that Scotland performed above the OECD average for reading and science and that we outperformed a greater number of competitor countries than in 2012. And PISA also showed that we narrowed the gap between the most and least disadvantaged pupils, um, the only UK country to do so. However, presiding officer, let me make clear the Scottish survey of literacy and numeracy results in 2014 on numeracy and the results this year uh, on literacy certainly do show that we need to step up the pace of change. And that is why this government has made it its key focus of our programme for government to close the attainment gap so that every child in every community gets every chance to succeed at school and in life. Therefore, we're investing £100 million through a national attainment fund over four years, targeting support at those authorities with the most deprived communities, providing schools and greater access to expertise and resources through the Scottish Attainment Challenge. Attainment advisors for every local authority area are currently being recruited. 
And the Raising Attainment for All programme now has 23 local authorities and 180 schools committed to improving literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing. And underpinning this will be new duties through the Education Bill to ensure that councils and indeed ministers attach priority to the ongoing challenges of inequalities of outcome. And I trust that we can rely on Labour members for the support at all stages of this bill. And I want to finish, presiding officer, by offering reassurance to members that they should not doubt the passion or the sense of urgency that I and this government have to address this issue. We know we have more to do and we have to do it now. Every school, every education authority needs to take action and we will not rest until we see clear evidence that educational outcomes are improving for every child in Scotland. And the spirit of consensus that has underpinned Curriculum for Excellence needs to be maintained and plied for this wider effort and we need to keep clear in our minds our key priorities to ensure that each and every child in Scotland is indeed on a personal journey to excellence. Thanks very much. Would you like to move the amendment? In my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move amendment 13203.1. Ms Scanlon, six minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we also welcome the Labour Party's debate on Scotland's economy and specifically on the essential skills, training, qualifications and basic education required in order to ensure that, ensure that people from all backgrounds and all ages in Scotland benefit from the opportunities to work and to start a business. I have to say I'm pleased to note that the Scottish Government, after eight years in office, uh, now admit uh, the drop in performance in both reading and writing. I think this is a good starting point for the debate and I'm also pleased to hear after eight years that this has now become an urgent issue. So in moving the amendment in my name, presiding officer, I'd like to quote from some emails received from parents and teachers regarding the reduction in subjects and their concern at limiting choices in hires and putting pupils in Scotland at a disadvantage. The first from a parent here in Edinburgh, and I quote, We were told that the new curriculum for excellence would result in all schools going from eight standard grade equivalents to six. We were advised that this was the new way for all and that children would be given more time to devote to subjects and this would improve their grades. Then she discovered that this diktat was referred to as a consultation. And when she spoke to other parents in Edinburgh, she discovered that parents of pupils at Burrambure, Royal High, James Gillespie's and others were still doing eight standard grade equivalents, not six. And then the teacher, again in Edinburgh, uh, with the bright students who wanted to do chemistry and physics in S4, but they can't because of their other choices from the very restricted menu on offer, they can only do one science along with PE or retail. Now, there's nothing wrong with PE and retail. I have spoken out on retail opportunities many times in this Parliament. But just trying to get in, try getting into medical school with PE and retail hires. It's very difficult compared to a science. So one pupil responded, and I quote, you make us do subjects we don't want to do for an extra year, and then you don't let us choose the subjects that we do want to do. And next year, the same school and the same teacher will be running a composite class, National 4, National 5 and higher, bringing together physics, biology, craft and design and technology into one course. And how often has it been stated in this Parliament the importance of science-based subjects and understanding? And now I come to the painstaking data from Dr Jim Scott. Another area of concern, the drastic reduction in attainment totals for levels 3 to 5. The fall in attainment at level 3 is 58% uh, last year compared to the year before. Level 4, 23% fall in attainment. Level 5, a 10% fall, leading to an overall average of 20% reduction last year compared to 2012-13. This is based on Dr Jim Scott's research and I'm happy to hand it over to the Cabinet Secretary. And as if this wasn't bad enough, the Scottish Government's Opportunities for All guarantee, and I did read the 2011 manifesto before coming here, of a place in education or training 
So why, given this guarantee, are 29,000 16 to 19-year-olds not in education, employment or training? And when looking at schools, the government must ask, what happens to the 66% of pupils in P7 who perform well or very well in numeracy and compare that to 42% of S2 pupils who perform well or very well? What happens in two years at secondary school that leads to a 24% drop in numeracy standards? And we also learn from Audit Scotland there's no consistent approach to tracking and monitoring progress of pupils from P1 to S3. And although some councils test at P1, P3, P5, P7 and S2, others don't. The Cabinet Secretary last night said they already have assessment tools and systems in place at schools, local and national level. So why aren't they being used? And why do they need to be simplified before implemented? Yesterday at the Education Committee, we heard evidence from East Renfrew Council. They hold comprehensive data on attainment of all children through analysis of baseline standardised tests at P3, P7, P3, P5, P7 and S2, as well as SQA results. So if East Renfrewshire schools can collect this information through testing, to inform them about a child's development and support needs, why can't it be done in the rest of Scotland? And unfortunately, East Ren can't compare to any other schools because it's their tests and their tests alone. We have welcomed the attainment advisors and the 100 million investment over four years, but I was a bit surprised to read in Scotland on Sunday, these are secondments for 12 months or 23 months, not for four years, and I would also maybe pass this to Stuart Stevenson because there's no salary uh, on it, so we can't e they don't even know how much they'll be paid, presumably what they're already paid. So unless we know who needs the support to assist their attainment, unless we have accurate data, unless there's an evaluation, we don't know where the 100 million will go. Again, and must be to I can close, see please. my time is almost up. So finally, colleges... 150,000 cut in part-time places does not help attainment one bit. And the cuts to the over 25s whose lives have been transformed. I know that. I was a part-time student. I was over 25. I was a single parent with two children. I had all those opportunities before going to university. This door is well and truly closed for future and that's much to be regretted and Thank blamed entirely at the door of this government. Thank you very much. Now call on Willie Rennie. Speak to and move Amendment 13203.2. Mr Rennie, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment uh, in my name. Across the United Kingdom, we've seen unemployment fall. We've seen hundreds of thousands of jobs being created. We've got wages outstripping inflation and growth rates in the United Kingdom that are vying with the United States of America, combined with big tax cuts for those um, on low and middle incomes. If we contrast that with what is happening in the recent set of statistics in Scotland, where the unemployment level has risen in Scotland, with in particular 5,000 women leaving employment, that contrasts badly with the rest of the United Kingdom, and within that context, it's a timely debate today. We need the Scottish Government to examine every aspect of their policy to get Scotland back on the path of falling unemployment, to ensure a prosperous economy and futures which allows individuals to fulfil their potential. So I have to say I was quite disappointed with the Minister's amendment and her tone today. This Government must begin to acknowledge the weaknesses in its own feelings and in order for us to make real progress. And I have to say the interventions from the backbenchers, our own backbenchers today, the only answer they had to this problem was more powers for this parliament. No other ideas about education at all, only more powers. It's a stuck record and therefore they need to reflect on their eight years in power and eight years of failure. I welcome the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the funding through the Attainment Scotland Fund. But this government has had eight years in which to tackle inequality of attainment and has failed to do so. The minister cannot now 
with a great flourish of rhetoric, claim a new start. Children who started school in 2007 are now well established at secondary school. They don't get a second chance. The class of 2007 has witnessed this government's failure, its failure to deliver its promises, to reduce primary class sizes in one to three, its failure to improve the teacher-pupil ratios, and its failure to improve standards in maths, science and literacy. Look just at the detail, some of the detail on this. The number of teachers has fallen by 4,275 since 2007. The average P1 to P3 class now stands at 23 pupils, far from the 18 that was promised back in 2007. The PISA math scores has fallen in 2009, in fact, compared with 2012 as well. Results in the 2014 Scottish Survey of Literacy and numeracy published recently shows performance in reading dropped in primary schools between 2012 and 14, as well as in the second year of secondary school. The Minister has to reflect seriously on that record. Rather than just claiming it's a new start, she needs to take responsibility for the full eight years that her government has been in charge. It's perhaps no surprise that as a Liberal Democrat, Al and our amendment has focused on the early years and the importance of that crucial period in an individual's life chances. There's an ever-growing body of evidence that, that about how the, the quality of early years provision can support a child's brain development and make a positive difference to their life chances and their future participation in our society. Effective early years education offers the foundations for a healthy, all-round development. Studies like the effective provision of preschool education provide strong evidence to show the impact of high-quality childcare and highly qualified staff on children's outcomes. We know from that work that better qualified staff teams offered high-quality support for children developing communication, language and literacy skills, and their reasoning, thinking and math skills too. That is why we want more of Scotland's children to benefit from free nursery education. With provision in England outstripping that in Scotland, we cannot say we are giving Scotland's children the start that they deserve. This is not only a concern for the individuals, but also for our future economy. We are asking for our young people to play catch up from the age of two in what is already a hugely competitive global economy. But let me be clear, I'm not doubting, and there is no doubting, the talents of the potential of young people across Scotland. But we must do more, and we need to do more to unlock that talent, to ensure that every individual has the opportunity to fulfil their potential. That process of unlocking potential starts from a very early age. The government must also look at its record of helping disadvantaged pupils and of the continued attainment gap. There is evidence that the pupil premium introduced by the last UK government has had a positive impact in meeting its aims. An Ofsted report highlighted how the funding was used by one school to support a pupil who became temporarily looked after in year 11 following a family trauma as her work began to suffer. The school bought in counselling and other emotional support as well as an individualised programme of additional teaching, including daily maths tuition, extra English lessons and support in PE. It's that kind of individualised help and support which the pupil premium has allowed and which can truly turn around a young person's life. I hope that serious consideration will be given to similar funding approach in Scotland. That individualised approach, I'm in my last minute. Uh, an American politician, you Horace close, Mann, please. said nearly two centuries ago, education beyond all other devices of human origin is the great equaliser of the conditions of men, the balance wheel of social machinery. Education is an enduring legacy of opportunity and the government needs to step up to the mark. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, now move to open debate. Very, very tight for time today. Colin Kevin Stewart to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And first of all, uh, I'd like to first look at the motion that has been tabled by the Labour Party here today. Uh, and it says in that motion, 
uh, uh, their concerns of the new analysis uh, published by Dr Jim Scott. Now, in trying to get that analysis from SPICE, I managed to obtain this, one table. That's not analysis in my book. That was replaced by the same table today by the Labour Party at the back of the room, presiding officer. The only difference is that it's now in colour. If I am going to have to debate and analyse analysis uh, by uh, Dr Scott, I think it would be wise that we could all catch sight uh, of that analysis. Uh, what we have been told is that this was analysis that was uh, conducted for the Labour Party. Um, none of us have seen that, and as you rightly said earlier on, uh, presiding officer, that analysis is not easy, easily to come by. I'll take Mr Gray. Well, just to correct the member on a, a couple of uh, factual errors. The first is, this is not analysis undertaken uh, for the Labour Party. It's an analysis undertaken by Dr Scott in his capacity as a research fellow. And, and a moment, and a moment, and the data, the data, the data is the SQA data available Mr. Stewart, publicly Mr. Stewart, since Stewart, last sit down, December. Mr Stewart, let Mr Gray finish. Right. Mr. Stewart, speak. Th thank you, uh, Ms. Presiding Officer. What I would say you, is, uh, why, point why of then Mr. is Gray, that analysis sit down. available to some and not sit. others? Mr. Stewart, sit down. Thank you. Point of order, Hugh Henry. Presiding Officer, can you clarify the, the rules of this Parliament that when you call uh, a member to speak, that it would be you, uh, as a presiding officer, who determines when that person finishes? and that they are not shouted down by another speaker. I thank the member for his point of order. He is correct in raising that. Um, however, we will now proceed with the debate. Thank you. Um, that analysis is not publicly available. We have not been able to an catch sight of that analysis, and thereby it's very difficult to debate that analysis, I would argue. Uh, presiding officer, um, if I could move on, because other parts of the motion uh, talk about introducing a 50p tax rate to pay for a number of things. Um, I stand to be corrected that at this moment in time, this Parliament does not have the power uh, to raise the top rate of tax to 50 pence. I wish that were the case presiding officer, but that is one of the many powers that we still do not have. And beyond that, presiding officer, we heard uh, in answer to a question by my colleague Stuart Stevenson, Miss Bailey say um, that she reckons that it would be £20,000 a year uh, to employ a teaching assistant, and we think, uh, a quarter, we think £30,000 for literacy teachers. I'm quite sure that that does not include the whole employment cost of actually employing the folk that are mentioned in this motion. No, I've had enough from you, Mr Gray. I'll move on. Um, so, once again, we have a flaw in the Labour Party motion. It is little wonder um, that the last Labour got, government got itself into financial difficulties when they can't even calculate these things properly. But there we go, no surprise there. Um, presiding officer, um, I was um, shouted down earlier uh, for mentioning welfare reform and its effect on people throughout this country. And one of the things uh, which I have come across on numerous occasions uh, while I have been out and about is teachers and others saying that we do have a massive gap uh, in attainment which must, must be uh, broached. However, we are not going to be able to do so while we still have kids going to school with empty bellies because kids with empty bellies cannot learn. And one of the major problems that we have is the fact that welfare reform is having a major impact on people right across this country. Um, the Labour Party, uh, of course, uh, could have helped in terms of dealing with some of the empty belly problems by voting for free school meals earlier on uh, in this Parliament. And of course they voted against that. Um, how progressive is that, I would ask myself. 
But one of the key things that we need to do to tackle inequality, to broach that attainment gap, and to create a fairer society is actually to create a much better social security system and ensure that those folks who are in work are being paid properly so that they can afford the things that they need in their day-to-day -day lives. Unfortunately, Members presiding of officer, this is one of the things that the Labour Party and others in this place will not talk about. They will not talk about it because they do not want this Parliament to have those powers. And I'm quite sure, presiding officer, that we would do a much better job than the current Tory government and previous Westminster governments who have failed in this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Now Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Claire Adamson. Officer, uh, two minutes. central uh, economic facts underline, uh, underline uh, Labour's motion today. First, that education, especially quality education, is crucial for economic growth. And secondly, that inequality undermines economic growth. And that's really an orthodoxy now that is accepted by the OECD, the IMF, as well as individual, uh, notable individual uh, economists. And these two facts explain why the attainment gap is not just uh, uh, important and indeed catastrophic for the individual lives of many people in Scotland today, but is also harming our economy. Twice over, firstly by reducing the number of people with the level of education and skills uh, needed, uh, to advance in the employment uh, market and secondly of course by exacerbating the inequality that hinders growth and uh, Jackie Bailey quoted uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz on that particular subject of the relationship between uh, education uh, and, uh, uh, and inequality. Now, anyone who doubts uh, that particular analysis should, uh, should look at a very short uh, OECD video that I watched uh, this morning. It's less than five minutes in length, but it's absolutely brilliant in encapsulating that central uh, insight about inequality undermining economic growth. But it also advocates something else quite interesting, because I think we all accept the OECD is not some kind of a Marxist front. But they argue in that particular video and also in their other writings that, in fact, tax increases on the wealthiest are actually necessary to strengthen the economy, contrary to the neoliberal orthodox that we often hear about. And also, of course, they're crucial for providing the educational and other opportunities for those who are most disadvantaged in our society. And that is exactly what we are proposing in our motion today. Of course, Kevin Stewart's right that we haven't quite got the ability in terms of this tax power, but there is no doubt that we will have it uh, soon. And that's why it was a central proposal, obviously, in Labour's recent uh, election manifesto that we should have. I'll just finish this sentence, that we should use the money from the, the top rate tax to employ teaching assistants, uh, literacy teachers, uh, uh, focused uh, on the most disadvantaged schools, as well as the commitment that Jackie Bailey uh, reiterated to support uh, the lowest 20% per, uh, performing pupils in literacy uh, and numeracy, wherever they happen to live. I'll give Kevin way. Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Chisholm for giving way. Uh, Mr Chisholm may have mere, more knowledge than me. Does he have any idea when this Parliament is likely to get those tax raising powers. Because at this moment in time, I have no clue about when we are likely to get those powers Malcolm if we do. Well, I'm very confident that they'll be coming soon. Now, I'm not one, as members know, to, to bash uh, the Scottish Government at every opportunity, but there are some uncomfortable facts that they must uh, face and the SNP backbenchers must face in this uh, debate. Now, I don't think they can argue with the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy, which has been much referred to, and I think the Cabinet Secretary accepted in her speech last night that there are alarming declines uh, in the level of uh, numeracy and literacy uh, in Scotland. And I think these have to be addressed collectively by us all. Mary Scanlon made the interesting point that there was a particular decline from primary seven to S2. So that may be something we should focus on because I'm a supporter of the curriculum uh, for excellence, but it may be there has been a loss of focus on literacy and numeracy in the first two years of secondary school. And the cabinet secretary last night was surprised at some of the 
approach to literacy and numeracy in uh, uh, S1 and S2. And I was surprised as well because when I started teaching in the 1970s, language across the curriculum was a central mantra as well as being the title uh, of a very uh, important uh, textbook. So there may be lessons to be learned there, but of course the points made by Jackie Bailey about the wider issues, teacher numbers, class sizes, are of course equally important. Now we've heard a lot about Dr. Scott, but I, I do think this is an interesting table. I mean, Kevin Stewart made the first half of his speech sort of just saying there's not enough information there. Well, I'm sure we would like more, but we do have pretty important information there. And it's in two parts. There's the number of uh, exams that uh, students take in S4, and I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says about that, and I can see what she's saying about that, but I, I still have a sort of concern about that, particularly if we're thinking of STEM subjects, which we all accept are so important for the economy, and it may well be difficult, and this came up in the Science and Schools debate earlier this year, you know, if, if there's a declining number of science subjects being done because people can't do physics and chemistry or whatever, then I think there are questions that we have to at least ask there about that. But there is also the uncomfortable fact about the, uh, the, the attainment levels within that. And again, the most striking there that Ian Gray quoted was of those sitting, 92% passed in 12, 13 and 79% in 13, 14. So, okay, that was just two years. But I, I do think we have to take these figures seriously and express uh, a degree of concern about them. And having mentioned STEM subjects, I think that's something also that we need to focus on in colleges. We, we, we've got lots of figures that we keep banding about, about, about colleges, and, and it's well known what our concerns about that are. But one figure, particularly with reference to STEM and the effect of that on the economy, is that uh, there were 86,000 places in STEM subjects in colleges eight years ago, and the last year for which we have figures, there was 56,000. So again, surely that gives some rise for concern. I heard what, uh, I think it was Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham said at question time about more courses leading to employment in colleges, but that doesn't seem to sit very comfortably Order, with the decline members finishing, in so no one will STEM be intervening. subjects. I'm exactly on six minutes. I didn't have time to, what I wanted to say about early years, except to say I agree that possibly, in spite of all our talk about schools and colleges, perhaps the most important investment uh, for all sorts of things, including economic growth, is actually investment in the early years. Many thanks. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Graham Pearson, and we are tight for time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, at the start of this debate, indeed for possibly the first four minutes of Jackie Bailey's speech today, I thought we were going to get to some consensus about the devastating effect of inequality and the challenges ahead and come together on how we could do that. Um, I'm a bit sorry that the debate has um, taken a different direction in that area. Um, the, well, the first issue I have to raise is about the, um, the um, Dr Scott research that has been referenced. I have in front of me an email from Spice yesterday. It says the research was carried out for the Labour Party and the full document is not publicly available or published online. The party have today, yesterday, provided the the, the below table to SPICE, which summarises the finding of Dr Scott and which can be shared with, by SPICE with inquiries. I'm actually unclear as to who did the summary, whether this is Dr Scott's analysis or the Labour Party's. Ian Cray. To answer that question, the, the table is from Dr Scott's research. Um, and I can also uh, say, in all sincerity to the member, SPICE are wrong. Uh, we did not tell them this research was done for us, uh, and uh, I can only assume that they've made a mistake. I hope the, the member will appreciate that this is what has led to some of the confusions on these benches as to, to this report. Um, I can also say that from the table in front of me, um, I am concerned there doesn't seem to be any waiting for schooling, falling school rolls between the two years in, in, in connection. And also um, agree with the Cabinet Secretary that when taken out of context of the evidence to the Education Committee of knowing that pupils, the number of uh, subjects being studied by pupils this year was going to fall because that was the intention of Curricula for Excellence, that there is some confusion in just using the raw data. Jack Bailey. That the overall number of people taking these exams has fallen, and I don't, don't necessarily accept that, but, but let's put that to one side. How can you explain the percentage drop in attainment? Because that's not about the respective numbers. That's about an overall fall in attainment, despite who's sitting the exam. 
Claire Adamson. I think we have to look at this in the context of this was the second year of the fifth year exams. And we don't have all the information in front of us and we don't have the full detail of the, of the research, which is why it's very difficult for us to comment on it. But I don't think this government or anyone else will take any indication of a fall in attainment as, as w w lightly. And I think the Cabinet Secretary has shown that the higher levels um, are showing a continued increase and that we are doing year on year better than we have in this area. And I think, you know, we have the debate today and I just have to, to raise those issues. Um, can I, no, I've taken enough interventions, sorry. Um, Jamie Livingston, the head of Oxfam Scotland, in today's press has looked at the um, research that Oxfam did that shows that UK five families have roughly the same wealth as at least well off 20, 12 million people in Britain put together. And Oxfam state that they are non-political, but they also have a clear and unequivocal stand against such glaring inequality and an issue that they believe inextricably leads to poverty. When it comes to tackling poverty and inequality, Oxfam say that that includes action to ensure we have a just tax system for which everyone pays their fair share and everyone according to their means. And I think there is a degree of consensus that the tax system needs to change to achieve that. It's just unfortunate we don't have the power to do it within this parliament at this time. Boxfam also quote latest figures showing that 820,000 people live in poverty in Scotland and more than half of the working age adults in poverty live in households where at least one person is working. The old adage that work is the clearest route out of poverty is hollow, rings hollow and is no longer relevant to the situation we find with inner work poverty today. The Welfare Reform Committee has taken frequent um, evidence on the fact that of increased food bank use of the sanction system, the effects that has on families um, relying on social security. And we, we have seen that poverty is increasing as a result of the austerity agenda of the Westminster government. And I think Mary Scanlon um, was very passionate about the numbers and the figures, but she forgets that in that are the children that are suffering under her government's austerity regime and when we get the minister the, the Westminster Secretary of State for Work and Pension stating as regard further cuts coming our way we, we would have to do the work on it as we have done the work and it is not modelled and we'll let everybody know what that is. So £12 million of cuts are coming with no concordance of what the welfare budget needs to be no reason other than austerity ideology and no regard for the devastating impact on families who rely on social security, no regard to quality impact assessments or any sense of fairness or need in the government's agenda. I just want to finish, I'm very tight for time, presiding officer, but if I could reference the Science and Engineering Advisory Group, SEAG's report, and the work that they did in, in STEM subjects in, in this, the country, and they highlight that even a relatively small improvement in education standards can have large impacts on the economic, social, and cultural well-being of nations, and may offset, perhaps exceed the cost of effective educational reform. I believe that this government, working with partners such as SEAG, are moving towards that and if I can finally say that I know this is happening because I attended on the 26th and 27th of March Learning Festival in North Lanarkshire opened by Dr Alistair Allen which was looking at creative learning, a, a, an opportunity for all teachers to learn more about what is there to help them in their challenges in, in tackling the attainment gap. Thank you very much. Graham Pearson to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to support Jackie Bailey's uh, motion and uh, contribute to today's debate. One can understand why government would want to focus on all the plus points in, in our education system. And there is no doubt that we are gifted indeed with the professionalism of our teachers and those who support them in education day and daily in dealing with the pupils and students in our schools. However, as was touched on by Willie Rennie, we do need to look at the reality of what happens in our schools today and every day during the time of the eight years of this government. It is about pupils. It is about one chance in life, a chance that is given by education to move out of deprivation and poverty. The Cabinet Secretary was right to acknowledge last night her concerns about literacy. And I would add to that concerns about numeracy too. 
and she made some comments alluding to some teachers' impacts and their understanding of that challenge. These criticisms or these observations that she made last night were picked up by some as a criticism of the profession. Thereby stands the heat that lies at the centre of our debate. Too often we are diverted from the key issues that we are trying to understand. Education is particularly important not only to our economy and what it adds to our ability to participate and compete in this world, but it is of particular significance to those who come from poor areas, those that face deprivation of opportunity. For those who live there, education provides one of the only chances to escape poverty. This week, in the Daily Record, Joanne Martin from Postle Park reported that she had succeeded in achieving grades which should have allowed her to pursue a career in medicine, yep. only to find that that chosen career path was being frustrated in her belief because of the social strata that she came from and the family support that she received, great support from her mum, who was a part-time clean cleaner. Her view was supported by Vonnie Sandlin, the, the president-elect of the NUS in Scotland. And when we look at that position, we discover from the facts that fewer than one person in three leave school with at least one hire from schools located within the most deprived 10% of the areas in Scotland. At the same time, four out of every five pupils leave with at least one hire in the most affluent parts of Scotland. In a government that seems committed to social justice and equality, those statistics are difficult to face. Dr Jim Scott of the University of Edinburgh it shows that the number of candidates are gaining level three and five qualifications at SCQF, the replacement for standard grades have dropped by 20%. That's a challenge to any government that seeks to deliver equality of opportunity. Standards in literacy and numeracy in Scotland schools have fallen. I'm glad to take the intervention. Cabinet Secretary. All right. Thank, thanks to Mr Pearson. I just want to be clear that the number of people achieving qualifications at levels 3 and 5 did not fall by 20%. It fell by around 6%. And the mistake that Labour keep making is that they're talking about um, people, as in candidates, as opposed to the number of qualifications. And you can't compare uh, apples with pears. And typically there was two, two entries for standard grades at credit and General 11, where this was level 3 to Cabinet 5. Cabinet Secretary, can I hurry along? Graham Pearson. I, I, hear, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary says, and it's one thing to be amused by statistics, but the reality is out there to be faced and is reported every day in our schools. College admissions have fallen by 37 per cent, or some 140,000 places, since the SNP came to power. So that pathway to leave deprivation and poverty is becoming choked off by the decisions taken by this government in this country Absolutely. under the power that's available to them now. And at the same time that they're spending £7.599 billion pounds, eh, from budget to deliver for, for our children. If the SNP government is truly committed to delivering eh, in this respect, they should pay attention to Dr Jim Scott's uh, opinions in this matter. He's a respected academic. He reported to committee earlier this year, and I know having spoken, if I can finish the sentence, having spoken to Dr Scott at a committee meeting, he informed me that his report was submitted to officials of the government earlier this year, and that he supported the contents within that report. It was interesting to me particularly because at the meeting I attended, the Cabinet Secretary on that occasion, not the present one, reported the successes that have been achieved in relation to modern language teaching in our Scottish schools. Dr Scott reported exactly the opposite facts from the statistics that he had gathered in his report. 
So I would beg that the Cabinet Secretary connect with reality and give us the opportunity to see improvements in those accesses to education that are offered to those in deprived areas and those from poor circumstances. Thanks, Captain thank Secretary. you. John Mason, to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And firstly, can I say I am happy to welcome uh, this debate on education, as it appears in the motion, although I have to say the title, The Future of Scotland's Economy, uh, was just somewhat misleading. Clearly, the link between education and the economy is very strong, but it would have been helpful if Labour, if Labour had said that when they decided on the title of the motion. But I do accept Labour have been in somewhat of a muddle recently. One of the SNP's flagship policies has been free university education. And it is fascinating that universities are not mentioned in Labour's motion. Does Labour look down on academic achievement and the universities? Is Labour wanting to move resources from universities to schools and colleges? Now, they would be perfectly entitled to call for that if they want to, but to call for more emphasis in one area without stating that there should be less emphasis in another area does strike me as somewhat less than transparent. Of course, in colleges, as in other areas, we would all like to see more money available, but I would not want to see a return to the previous arrangements where it became purely a numbers game and students, including some with learning disabilities, were parked in courses that were really of no use to them. But there is also a question on how the colleges are run, as well as how much money they get. The situation in Glasgow has been concerning me for some time, with the apparent turmoil both at Clyde College, with the change of principal, and with the overall Glasgow College's regional board. I believe that one of the key ways of reducing inequality in Scottish society is strong and effective colleges. And the six community-based colleges in Glasgow, which are now merged into two, Kelvin and Clyde, have had a fair degree of success in this respect. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can give us any assurance later on concerning both Clyde College and the regional board. That money, eh, well, just give me a second, that money will not be wasted eh, with expensive bureaucracy and duplication, but it will be channelled into frontline education and the regional board will be able to handle that. Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Does the member believe that more people are moving into uh, further education and more staff are in further education now than there were prior to this government's reforms. John Mason. I believe that because the budget has been cut for this parliament, virtually all sections, apart from the health service, have had to be reduced. That is the reality. This week is also Scottish Apprenticeship Week, and I myself was out in Bailiston with some GHA modern apprentices on Monday, that reminded me again that we need to find the right role and the right employment for each and every individual. I think there has been too much emphasis on academic results in schools in the past, and we have seen some improvement moving away from that in recent years. There is still an overemphasis, in my opinion, on exam results, which are relatively easy to measure, compared to value added by a school, which is much harder to measure. Now, I do agree with the Labour motion when it mentions the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and this is particularly the case for girls and women, as we found in the Equal Opportunities Committee when we carried out our inquiry into women in work. In practice, there is still a tendency for men and women to enter traditional career paths, and it is not just money that will change this. However, very little detail from Labour as to what we can do or should be done to get more people into STEM. My own feeling that there is a strong emphasis on STEM in both government and parliament, but we are not seeing that worked out in practice at the grassroots. When I had a school visit here from one of my local secondaries recently, none of the pupils, boys or girls, were considering engineering. Why was that? Are the schools pressing too much for arts and similar academic subjects rather than more practical and technical subjects? Do we need the schools to emphasise more to pupils where the future jobs are likely to be? How do we change the attitudes in society to value something like engineering more highly? And how do we help young people lacking self-confidence and vision because perhaps no one in their family has been at college or university before? Now, while I do accept that school resources are a key element of that, this kind of question about attitudes is not just about money. And while we are thinking of attitudes, the attitude to self-employment is another challenge. Many of us, when we were at school, did not seriously consider setting up our own business, but assumed that academic achievement and being employed was the way ahead. Yet some of our most successful business people do not have fabulous academic records and often took qualifications later in life, or in some cases, not at all. 
So the concept of linking the economy and education, as in today's debate, is an important link, but I do not think it is the be-all and end-all. Again, I am reminded that we need to find the best outcome for each individual young person and not take too simplistic an approach, counting what is easily measured. With my finance hat on, we have to live within our means, and that means largely the block grant at the moment. Cuts from Westminster, as I've said, have led to cuts in most areas of the Scottish budget, so that is hardly a shock to anyone here. Now, I personally am very open to a 50p higher rate of income tax, and ideally we should combine that with national insurance. Even with a 50p income rate tax, the 2p national insurance makes the combined rate of 52 less progressive, and I would like us to look at a combined rate of perhaps of 60 pence. But when is this 50 pence rate to be available, as my colleague Mr Stewart already said? Will it be when this Parliament gets the power in income tax, or will it be when Labour gets into power at Westminster? Either way, we seem to be waiting for quite a long time. And the figure that we have estimated for what we would get from 50p rate of tax is an extra £13 million. And I'm not sure that quite meets what Labour is hoping for in this motion. So in conclusion, the economy and education are two very important topics. But I think the challenges facing us in both areas are slightly more complex than Labour seems to suggest. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Mark MacDonald to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I think that what we have uh, here today is a, a, a debate which, and I think Jackie Bailey in her speech um, spent a large part of the first section of her speech talking about things that didn't appear uh, in the Labour Party's motion uh, around some of the economic areas of policy um, and then got into, I think, the substance uh, of what the Labour Party wants to debate. Now, Mr Mason is quite right that the information that SPICE have provided uh, suggests that £13 million is what would be achieved by the levelling of a 50 pence top rate uh, of income tax in Scotland. So it doesn't meet, at the very uh, first instance, the £25 million that Labour say they would use uh, via a 50 pence top rate. And even beyond that, if we look at the, uh, the numbers of staff that are talked about in the motion uh, for, for being employed, um, it also, uh, there is a question as to whether or not the sums add up in that respect as well, both for a £13 million, if that was what you raised, but even beyond that to a £25 million if you were to include on costs as well. But I think um, the, the, the debate essentially, um, the, the sort of centrifugal point of this debate is the inequality agenda and how best to tackle that. And I don't dispute the, the, um, the, the, the notion that education is a means by which people can escape the trapping, uh, of in, the trapping effect of inequality. That, I think, uh, is, is well understood. But what you're talking about there is a situation where you are uh, essentially doing something in spite of an individual's circumstances rather than materially changing them to improve their outcomes as a consequence. If what you're saying is that we need to focus our efforts into uh, these areas and work against the uh, factors, the external factors that are affecting children's educational outcomes, then I would agree that that is something that we have to do. And, and based on the evidence at the moment, is something that the Cabinet Secretary herself has said that she wishes to do. But you also have to then look at how you address those external factors that are impacting upon those children on the, those families, on those communities. Because while we want absolutely to have those children get the best possible educational outcomes, we also want to ensure that the lifestyles that exist around those children are materially improved. It cannot simply be the case, perhaps a little bit later, I just want to develop the point a little bit further, Mr Giffen. It cannot simply be the case that we say that we will work to help those children to escape the situations in which they find themselves as a result of the inequalities that exist within society, and that will therefore resolve those inequalities, because there are adults, there are family networks, there are communities which are affected by those deep uh, inequalities that simply uh, working through the education system alone will not resolve and so it goes wider than that and, and before I move on to the wider section I'll, I'll take Mr Griffin's intervention. Mark Griffin. Thank you Mr Macdonald. I take his point on the, the, the wider issues affecting poverty but does he not agree that um, by focusing resources in that area that we start to break people out of that cycle, that vicious cycle of poverty and that education in itself is a way to, to tackle, tackle poverty, not overnight 
um, but on a, on a generational basis. Mark MacDonald. The, the, no disagreement from me on that, and I think I made that point uh, earlier on uh, in, in my speech. Um, I mean, I represent a constituency which has poverty amidst plenty. My constituency office is based in one of the uh, most deprived communities in the city of Aberdeen, but also within my constituency, I have communities which have less than 5% child poverty rates. So I recognise the need to ensure that resources are focused on those areas that need intervention. And that's what brings me on to the, the other aspect of this when we're looking at the inequality agenda. And it's about the, the economy, it's about employment, it's about creating the circumstances whereby individuals in these communities can access well-paid, sustainable employment. And that is what brought me to the intervention that I, I raised with Jackie Bailey, because I, 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 I'm not one of these folk who sees the uh, debate simply being more powers is the answer to everything. But, but at the same time, you have to look at where the powers rest that can best tackle the societal inequalities that face these communities. Now, education, I agree absolutely, and I've said already that focusing on education is something we need to do, and the Cabinet Secretary has made that point very clearly. But beyond that as well, we have to then look at how we affect the material circumstances of individuals in these communities. How do we make people's incomes better? How do we make people's employment better? And one of the ways that we do that is through wage policy, is through employment policy, is through being able to take the measures to tackle things like, for example, exploitative zero hours contracts, like being able to take steps around minimum wage policy and addressing that in a wider context than simply looking at a living wage which is uh, narrowly defined to the public sector because that's the only way that we can Im implement it at present. So until we are able to take that basket of measures forward as well, that is something uh, that will hamstring some of the efforts because teachers are doing a fantastic job in our communities, particularly in our deprived communities. But when a child arrives at the school gate with an empty belly because of the fact that their family has to rely on food banks, or when they are affected by uh, circumstances outside of that classroom, the school is only ever going to be working in a situation where it is battling against external factors, not being able to develop that child's full potential. So I agree absolutely, focus on education, but we have to have a wider focus than simply education. Otherwise, those children and those schools will continue to be battling against external factors and not working to the best possible outcomes for the child. Thank you. And I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Chick Brody. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. We all know that the future of our economy is crucial to the future of our people and the cohesiveness of our society. In many ways, of course, Scotland's economy is successful, especially when we compare it to other less uh, prosperous nations across the world. But our economy has a massive and glaring fault line running through it, and that is the unequal distribution of the gains of our economic success and the poverty that many people have mentioned. And low pay and job insecurity is at the heart of our country's problems. On Monday night, the excellent BBC Scotland Investigates documentary exposed the crushing, debilitating and grinding impact of low pay on people and their families. It showed how it saps morale and impacts on every aspect of family life. People unable to pay energy bills, people left staring at an empty fridge, children going without the very basics. This is the harsh reality, not just of a few people, but for one in five Scots. And I'm ashamed to say it's happening in my street, in my village, my region, and just yards from this building. And people are crying out for action. They need our help now. And we have a moral responsibility to do something about it. Not next month, next year, at some time in the future, when we gain additional powers and the government of the day may or may not use those additional powers, we need action now. And we cannot continue to blame someone else or hide behind someone else's inactions or inactions. Appalling as it is, that does not feed another child. So let us take our jobs seriously and think about how we can affect change and do it quickly and do it now. We know that the government did not embrace radical change last year when the procurement bill was going through this parliament. But I hope that the government recognises that that was a mistake and that we can and should revisit that now. We could also... Stuart Stevenson. 
Uh, I wonder if the member has read section H1 in Schedule 5 of the 1998 Scotland Act, which reserves the 1996 Employment Rights Act to Westminster and therefore deprives us of the power to legislate for what people are paid in this place. I absolutely agree that we should do it and we would make common cause in doing the same thing. Neil, but does Neil he Finley. take the legal point? Neil Finley. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was just reading it five minutes ago um, and I can't help but recognise the glee with which Mr Stevenson tells us that we can't do anything. That's the problem, Mr Stevenson. We should be doing what we can to help people now, not gleefully telling us what we cannot do. Absolutely. We should go back to the EU and ask a different question on procurement and the living wage. I would suggest that we ask how can we use public procurement to extend the coverage of the living wage. We should look at how the government pays out grants through regional selective assistance and other subsidies. Money going to companies, charities, agencies, all the rest of it should have criteria and conditionality on paying conditions as part of the grant awarding process. We should ensure inward investors like Amazon, who we paid £10 million to locate in Fife, pay fair wages and offer decent conditions as part of the grant award. We should look at the small business bonus and have differential rates for those who pay the living wage and meet other fair employment criteria. We should look at the charitable and social enterprise se sector and urge them to lead the way and be exemplars in their employment practices. I know many of them do, but not all of them. We could, if we had the will, bring all the parties together to tackle this matter head on, cooperatively, alongside trade unions and civic society. Or we can sit back and point the finger and say it's not my or it's not our fault. And I hope the government will set aside its past approach and move on and show that this parliament, we can put aside political differences to act quickly. I'll tell you, I'm up for that, but I just wonder if the government is. President officer, the Labour motion focuses on the important issue of education. On educational and attainment, and, and on college policy, the record of this government could be described as poor at best and offensive at worst. We have witnessed a drop in young people gaining level 3 to 5 qualifications, as has been mentioned. The Cabinet Secretary jumped up to tell us it is not 20 per cent reduction, it is 6 per cent. Forgive me for not offering you congratulations and a round of applause on your performance, Cabinet Secretary. 2,500 college jobs gone, 130,000 places lost. And once again, the poorest communities suffering most are being failed again by a lack of focus on those who have not enjoyed their share of this country's wealth. And whilst new policies like the attainment challenge and the like are welcome, they're a drop in the ocean when we see this against the backdrop of the savage cuts to local government. West Lothian Council, covering the constituency of the Cabinet Secretary, has had an £88 million cut in its budget. And in order to meet the government's demand on teacher numbers, the council needs 42, 42 more teachers. Uh, and funding from the Scottish government will deliver how many? Nine. Nine further teachers. Budgets from other services will have to, ha, that have been cut will have to be cut again and again. And this is repeated across budgets and local authorities across the country. Yet the Cabinet Secretary seeks to blame teachers. It's everybody else's fault. It's anybody's fault, not hers and not the government she's been part of for the last eight years. President officer, we cannot go on like this. The cohesiveness of our society will be determined by driving up incomes and education is a key ingredient. We can either work together to do that or we can stand and point the finger, blame someone else, anybody else. Thank you. And I call Chick Brody to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, President Officer. I'm somewhat bemused by the debate today and its selection as penned in the last paragraph, saying its selection of education is both, is both key to addressing inequality in our society and a crucial investment in our economy. Of course it is, as Mark Macdonald so elusively pointed out, but one key, albeit very important, to addressing these both, both these issues. My bemusement is also... Uh, largely caused by the motion's call for an impact assessment uh, of the uh, attainment gap uh, in Scotland schools. The Education Committee is doing that very thing. 
uh, at this moment. Now, I have to say, with very significant input from uh, two, uh, its two Labour members and indeed from Mrs Scanlon, the route to, we believe, to closing the attainment gap by that, by our committee, uh, considers and will consider the need for improvement in increased skills and achievement, and thus the, uh, and thus the economy. But apart from money, we'll also consider all of the other things that contribute to investment and assessment of the roles of parents, teachers, associated organisations, local authorities and so on. At its heart, I believe, is fairness as, 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 we're, as we're tackling it. A, tackling inequality as part of it and supporting equality of access, of course, uh, as a priority to education and a hurdle to be overcome in the education field as we plan for ever great and greater sustainable economic and environmental growth. But there are, of course, as I say, other issues that impact that. Presiding so in that one context, the motion rightly speaks of education as one key element in the future economy of Scotland. But then the motion elsewhere goes astray. It references the OECD report. I, I, I have it here. It makes no mention of Scotland. It does, however, of course, highlight, uh, as the motion uh, should have recognised, that the ever-increasing disparity uh, is in, in equality is one of the UK's making over the last 30 years. If you doubt me, read the full OECD report, or more importantly, uh, read Joseph Stiglitz's very informative book, The Price of Inequality. Education attainment and our economy has been at the mercy of that lemming-like philosophy of financial greed as pursued by UK governments over that period of time. A rising income inequality amid two recessions, which in the latter one having curbed uh, Scotland's ability, despite what Mr Finlay says, I don't know where we're going to print all this money, curb Scottish budgets from the UK. Income equality rising by three, per, three Gini points has dragged down economic growth by 0.35% per, per year for not just the last seven years, but the last 25 years. And given the economic cycle drag for some time before that, between 1990 and 2010, economic growth would have been, could have been, uh, 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 nine, per, nine percentage points higher if income levels uh, had been held at steady at the 1985 level. From that growth, from that growth would have flown more revenue and the ability to spend more uh, if the government so, government so willed on things like education and reducing the inequality gap. So to help you again, that 1985 is 23 years before this government came to power. And successive UK governments have not only run finances into the ground, but have done the same because they had put consumption before investment in our skills, their productivity, and in our children. No evidence anywhere of tackling an inequality, an unfairness, an injustice that sees the UK now with the fourth highest level of income inequality in the OECD countries. And Scotland's budget, and I repeat, has suffered as a consequence. No point in the, there is absolutely no point, and I welcome the comment from Neil Finlay at the end about talking and working together, but there's no point in Labour coming here, weeping crocodile tears, having hitched their wagon to that lot in the referendum uh, campaign last year. If we are to address... Mr Brodie, if we are to manage, Mr. Brodie, no, Mr. It, Brodie. I have a point of order, and before I take the point of order, I was about to speak to you about unparliamentary language. Mrs Scanlon. Uh, presiding officer, can I just say, I do understand that we are expected to talk to colleagues in a courteous manner. I do not think referring to us as that lot is courteous in any way. May I ask through your officers that the member apologise and retract that statement? Members should be courteous to each other under the standing orders. They should also address their remarks through the chair and they should not speak while the presiding officer is speaking. Mr Brodie, please resume. Of course, I uh, accept the, and, uh, and will apologise, but having made the, the point, the point is now made. If we are to address, to manage not just poverty, which is absolutely critical, but also address lower incomes, redistribution of wealth through a unified tax and benefit system, then we can fully further expand attainment, personal development and skills allied to vocational, to vocational and academic aspirations. That can, no, I've already I'm had afraid one. Mr Brody is closing. can only come eventually with full financial responsibility. We have to acknowledge and recognise our place 
indeed our elevation in the global e education galaxy, but we are still recognised as a core of education skills. And against that, presiding officer, we could sit here and swap conflicting numbers, as we apparently wish to do, but what we need to do rather is to get behind our excellent teachers, our college lecturers, our parents and the pupils themselves, to focus on the changes and the challenges which we are now support, supporting and, and producing the funds like the Attainment Challenge Fund and school improvement partnerships, etc. We have to work together to make the change and the challenges, diminish the, the change and the challenges that we currently face. So let's do that. John McAlpine to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Jackie Bailey's motion highlights OECD research published in December last year that found income inequality has a negative and statistically significant effect on medium-term economic growth. That same analysis tells us that the Gini coefficient for the OECD has increased from 0.29 in the 1980s to 0.32 in 2012. So inequality is a growing problem right across Western developed societies. Uh, it's particularly a problem in the UK, um, the United Kingdom, the Union, which Jackie Bailey and her Conservative partners and Better Together campaigned so vigorously for Scotland to retain, saying that we were better together. Indeed, as part of the Smith Commission, Labour continued to repeat this mistake and dug their heels in to prevent a transfer to Scotland of the powers that would allow us to reduce inequality in our society, most notably in terms of the minimum wage and welfare. Perhaps they will now consider the folly of that position in the, result, in the light of the general election result when the people of Scotland told them exactly what they thought of Scottish Labour and their position. Yeah. Jack Bailey. Um, I understand the member's argument. It is a cyclical one that she makes constantly. But, but can I just point her to Joseph Stiglitz and his view that inequality, one of the three determinants of inequality that actually provides a solution is education. That is wholly devolved. So what has her government in the last eight years done to actually tackle inequality? John McAlpine. I, I'm very glad she, she mentioned uh, Professor Stiglitz. Um, if she is a, a real admirer of Stig, Stiglitz, she may have heard him on Radio 4's Start the Week uh, this week when he praised the Scottish Government's record uh, on education as a means of reducing inequality and, uh, and spoke at some length about how the Scottish Government uh, was pursuing social democratic policies that were absent in the rest of the UK. And uh, he, he certainly um, didn't stint in his praise of the Scottish Government with regards to education. Um, only this week, the European Union uh, research told us that the UK was the most unequal country in Europe. The world's... Uh, for Mr. Uh, Professor Stiglitz has... Um, uh, we've already heard, is the, world, the world's foremost authority. And uh, he, um, he has made it very, very clear what he thinks of the UK and particularly their, um, following the American model of higher education, which has entrenched and driven inequality, not just in the US and the societies uh, that have followed that model. And uh, I'd be interested to, to, to know what Professor Stiglitz thought of uh, the UK Labour Party going into the last general election arguing that students in England and Wales should pay £6,000 a year in tuition fees uh, for university. Um, he certainly wouldn't approve of that and certainly compares very poorly with our record in Scotland, which is second to none in Europe. Um, yes. Joanne Lamont. I wonder if you think he would approve of cuts to bursary to the poorest students in Scotland in comparison with the rest of the United Kingdom. The poorest support for students across the United Kingdom, the highest dropout rates. I would have thought that anyone who was committed to equality in education would at least look at these statistics and think about what we could do now to make a difference to Tom their McAlpine. lives. Well, the National Union of Students have actually praised the package in, on offer um, by the Scottish Government for students as uh, the best in the UK. Um, research by the National Union of Students, incidentally, um, showed that uh, participation in higher education decreases by 4.4% for every £1,000 increase in fees. So you uh, can add up uh, the, the cost of labour, £6,000 a year, uh, university fees. Uh, given that we're debating Labour business today, it's perhaps uh, worth, worth noting that uh, Labour actually voted against 
the Post-16 Education Act, which put into law for the first time a requirement for universities to widen accent, access for students from poorer backgrounds. Um, at that time, Labour refused to listen to people like the National Union of Students in Scotland and John Henderson, Chief Executive of Scotland's Colleges, and Professor Sir Timothy O'Shea, then Principal of Edinburgh University, who all praised the bill which, uh, which, which Labour inexplicably uh, voted against. And no, I've already taken two interventions. The members approach in our last minute. Thank you. Uh, my colleague Kevin Stewart uh, talked passionately the effects of welfare reform and social inequality. And this has been self-evident for some weeks. We've been taking evidence in the Welfare uh, Reform Committee um, on the effect of austerity on, uh, on families. And uh, it was very notable a few weeks ago, we took evidence from social work chiefs that talked about the effect on families and how the number of children at risk and the number of children being taken into care was rising as a result of welfare cuts. And uh, we know from Sheffield Hallam's university research that those welfare cuts impact most directly on couples uh, with children and single parents with children. Um, it follows that if, if at the sharp end that's happening, of course, uh, attainment is going to be affected by, uh, by a rise in austerity, which I have to say the Labour Party uh, did very little to counter in the last uh, general election by uh, supporting £30 billion worth of cuts over the next few years, which could only make the situation worse. So I'll just uh, finish off by quoting uh, the, the name of the day, Professor uh, Order, Joe please. Stiglitz. Members closing. Yes, Professor Joe Stiglitz, um, who in The Price of Equality said that the facts should not get in the way of a pleasant fantasy. And I think that's a lesson for the Labour Party. They should not the facts of their own record in supporting Order. Tory austerity and get away from the pleasant fantasy that the SNP is responsible for everything. Order. Mark Griffin to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, President mm -hmm. Officer. Addressing the attainment gap in our society is our top priority because it's the right thing to do to break down the barriers that those in the poorest communities face but not just because it's the right thing to do because it makes sense economically and we welcome the Scottish Government's recently announced plan to try and tackle it after eight years in office. Um, educational inequality is a symptom of a deeper problem of poverty which we need to address and so the focused nature of any programme is vital. You know, I've used this example before, but I live in, in Cumberland and the variation in educational, educational attainment across the town is, is massive. Um, in Cumberland North, the level of child poverty is 8%, which is far too high. Um, but when you walk across the footbridge, across the M80 into Cumberland South, a two-minute walk, child poverty trebles almost to a staggering 23%. And as, as I've said, that difference in child poverty impacts on the educational attainment of young people, which, which can stop them breaking out of that vicious cycle of poverty. And the measures that we agree to tackle attainment must be focused on our most deprived communities as a result. With that in mind, um, Scottish Labour would use the additional revenues from a new 50p tax rate redistributing resources from those who can afford it to those who need it most to invest an additional £25 million per year over and above the government's proposal to tackle educational disadvantage. We would double the number of teaching assistants in every primary school associated with the 20 secondary schools facing the greatest challenges of deprivation. We would introduce a new literacy programme for schools and recruit and train literacy specialists to support pupils in the associated primary schools and first and second year pupils in each of those 20 secondary schools. We would also offer support to parents so that they can learn with their children and we will introduce a special literacy support programme for looked after children. We would also ask Education Scotland to carry out an annual review on progress in tackling educational inequality in Scotland schools through the Schools Inspectorate programme. Now, that would include a specific report on looked after children and <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning would also report to Parliament on the progress being made annually on reducing the attainment gap to allow 
the progress to be monitored and scrutinised by us in Parliament. Now, there are also other issues related to poverty and inequality which are impacting on educational attainment, like the increase in the use of private tutors and the use of uh, placing requests. There has been a 300% increase in the use of private tutors in the last year alone, and wealthier families have the ability to give their children an extra boost compared to children and families who can't afford private tuition. Yeah. This can be used when a child is struggling in a particular area or to help in the run-up to exams, and in itself isn't a bad thing. But where is the support for the pupil from the poorer background when they're struggling or need that support during exam time? We've supported a uh, provision of high-quality wraparound care for primary school pupils, like the provision of breakfast clubs and homework clubs to give pupils a productive start and end to the day while suiting the needs and requirements of working parents. That would give all pupils, regardless of their family income, that extra support and learning. And supported study sessions are often run in schools and evening uh, exam times to support pupils. But this is offered by committed, motivated teachers who offer up their own time to support their pupils. And that's an excellent way of supporting pupils at exam time, but it's patchy across the country and across subjects. And there is an issue of transport costs for pupils who would normally get the school bus home, which again impacts disproportionately on families um, with lower incomes. The, the placing request as well also creates a two-tier system of education and is causing problems for education authorities in managing school staff and the school estate. As soon as a particular school starts to get a, a reputation, a perception amongst parents of slipping or failing, or another school starts getting a better reputation, parents with the means to pay for transport will use the placing request system to move their children out of the catchment area to another school. We're then left with a situation in some schools where only the children from the poorest family in the area attend, and the impact that has on attainment levels is clear to see. Now, President Officer, I'm, I'm glad the government are making educational attainment a priority after eight years in government. I hope that they will look at some of the areas that we've spoken about today and they can start by improving their own plans by redistributing wealth and increasing the resources available to families in our poorest communities. Thank you. Many thanks. And the last open debate speaker is Stuart Stevenson. No more than six minutes, please, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me just uh, posit an approach to how we might deal with the issue that's before us. Uh, we should describe the problem. We should obtain the information about it. Uh, we should extract data that's meaningful. We should normalise the data across the timeline that it's spread. From that, we should identify solutions. We should then compare the identified solutions with each other and select solutions that we take forward, find the finance and implement, and then we should start again because it's unlikely that one time round the loop will solve the problem. And I think one of the things that comes out of the debate is that in our describing the solutions, there actually is comparatively little difference between us across the, uh, the chamber. We accept uh, that there is a challenge before us and that this challenge will be one which will endure over the long term, but which we must make some progress with. Now, obtaining information. I think we're not doing quite so well there. Uh, we've got uh, a table from Dr Jim Scott's research, uh, but there is no context. Oh, yes. If... Do I allow it? As how many times in the last eight years that finding data, interrogating and finding solutions has already been done? Because the point is not to dis not to diss the evidence that somebody's presented, but accept there is a problem, and wh whether we're spending the money on the right things or not. And I am concerned. It seems particularly the backbenchers, rather than the Cabinet Secretary, who want to close down a debate, have an argument about the evidence, rather than agreeing there is a problem and coming to agreement what the solutions might Stuart be. Stuart Stevenson. It, it would be helpful if the member actually listened to what I had said, Presiding Officer, because I acknowledged 
the challenge that is before us, and I do so again for the hard of heeding, if there are any who thus described are present now. Now, to return to uh, Dr Scott's uh, such extract from the data as there is, in and of itself it tells me almost nothing. And the reason it tells me nothing is because it fails a number of the tests I've described. It is data, I accept that, it has a timeline. I have no knowledge of what normalization has been done between the different parts of the timeline so that it is proper to compare one year to another. It does, I'll make a little progress, but I may come back. Uh, I, I also have no information about the sources of each element of data that is on this single sheet of paper. An academic, one moment please, an academic paper would normally have that information. And I expect that the whole paper probably does. But I think, I just say gently to my colleagues on the left of the chamber, that it generally be helpful to their cause and to good debate if we had had the whole paper. Uh, I, uh, forgive me, I will take Mr Finlay first. Neil Finlay. It's, it's abundantly clear that uh, neither Dr Scott nor anyone else in this chamber is on the same intellectual wavelength as uh, Mr Stevenson, but that comes as no surprise to any of us. So maybe he could tell us in his you know, wisdom what the problems are in Scottish ed education, because we will all sit here absolutely wrapped at his um, Stuart, intelligence. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm conscious of the fact I've six minutes, but I also, while accepting plaudits, which are entirely due to the genetic inheritance from my parents, perhaps more than my own efforts, um, that the real point that we all have to engage in, let's make common cause about getting the whole picture in front of us so we can pick out the bits and start to agree the bits we want to prioritise. Now, the, 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 the Labour Party's uh, motion before us uh, does move to solutions. It, for example, uh, talks about uh, 10 new literary te teachers and doubling the number of teaching assistants in associated primary schools for 20 uh, schools facing the greatest challenge. Now, I can't possibly rebut that as a proposal because I don't have any of the workings as to how we've arrived at that as the magic bullet. By the way, it might be the correct answer. I don't reject it because it's come from the benches opposite, but neither can I accept it because I have no workings. So I don't know what the axioms upon which it was based. I don't know what the inbuilt assumptions. I don't know even what the policy objectives uh, in any detail were. But let me also turn to the underlying numbers behind uh, the Labour Party's proposal. I, in an earlier part of the debate, I simply asked, how much a teaching assistant would cost to employ and how much a literacy teacher. I got a fairly definite 20,000 for the former, a less certain response on the latter. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, per perhaps Mr Stevenson will excuse uh, the, the memory of uh, an older man. Uh, the correct figures are £36,705 for the literacy specialist, £14,880 uh, for a teaching assistant, and that includes NI and pension payments. Just well, can, can I say, that is excellent. We will go away and I will, I will certainly have a look at it. I'm sure colleagues will equally do. Um, but it would, and I say gently, it'd be helpful to have this sort of thing before the debate rather than when the last backbench speaker, and I did ask for it earlier in the debate. Now, presiding officer, I'm in my last 45 seconds. Just let me illustrate how numbers can mislead. There's an article in the Financial Times today saying productivity in the UK is falling and that that's a good thing. And the reason is they're filling some of the relatively low-skilled jobs that have been difficult to fill in places like London. That's helping the overall economy, even though the productivity is going down because these jobs are being filled. An example of how numbers can give views without explanation and discussion. Let's have it, please. Presiding officer, thank, thank you. Thank you. We now turn to the closing speeches. The call in Willie Rennie. Maximum six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was intrigued by Stuart Stevenson's uh, remarks. Um, he talked about finding common cause across the chamber to get the whole picture. Well, this government have had eight years to get the whole picture, and one page produced from an academic 
has created more debate than any information provided by this government in those eight years. So perhaps it's a little bit too late for the SNP to look for the whole picture. But I want to actually start off by, by praising um, a member from the SNP benches. John Mason, I thought, made a very interesting and thoughtful contribution, as he often does in finance debates. He talked about real questions about the performance of Glasgow colleges. He talked about the balance between employment and self-employment and the value of self-employment. He talked about exams, just a strict analysis of exams and numbers versus a more rounded approach and analysis to the wider goals of education. I actually thought that his focus on education and employment work in the economy was actually a, perhaps a lesson um, for other SNP backbenchers who perhaps should be asking more questions of their government rather than trying to point fingers at every other government and everybody else who may have some responsibility for it. After all, we are in this chamber to hold the government to account. Whether we are Liberal Democrat, SNP, Conservative or SNP backbenchers, we all have a responsibility to hold the government to account. So I would advise SNP backbenchers to follow John Mason's great example from today, who has asked serious and thoughtful questions about the performance of the government, as well as wider questions. And in particular, I thought um, Joan McAlpine uh, was quite interesting, where she decided to lecture everybody else about student finance, forgetting the fact that we have seen students here since 2007 taking out double the amount of loans compared with that time, and bursaries having fallen to £600, a, an, an item that Joanne Lament identified. So far from dumping the debt, they have doubled the debt for students. We've also seen fewer students from deprived backgrounds in Scotland entering higher education. That's not a trend that's been followed in England. We've managed to change that. We've bucked that trend in England. Perhaps they should look south of the border for a lesson there too. Yes, we'll take it. Joanne McAlpine. D does, does this mean that uh, uh, he, he, he doesn't regret his own uh, former party leaders uh, uh, backtracking on making uh, universities free? D does he support the £9,000 tuition uh, fees that are imposed on well, students in England? I think it's England pretty well known my views are on the record with that regard. But it's disappointing that when faced with a serious question about people from deprived backgrounds, she chooses to point the finger at somebody else rather than reflecting on their own record. That is this government all over. Um, we've tried to make um, a serious um, contribution to this debate with two serious, I would say, liberal, person-centred, focused approach to try and tackle inequality. I actually take Mark Macdonald's point that it's not just uh, about education, but it's about the standards and employment and so on. Um, the kind of living wage aspects. I don't disagree with them on that. But I aspire for more from people from disadvantaged backgrounds. I just don't want them to aspire to just above the living wage. I want them to aspire to be even greater than that minimum living wage level. That's why I think, but I believe, that the route out of poverty is actually at the heart of it about education, quality education from the early years, the pupil premium that we have been implementing down south, but also making sure we create more jobs to give the opportunities for people. I'll take an intervention. Matt McDonald. Uh, I know the member does not seek to be disingenuous, but I too aspire to that same, uh, that same level. But he must also accept that dealing with the here and now is just as important as dealing with the, the future for, for these young people, because it is only through dealing with the here and now that we can improve that future for them. And that includes the external factors as well as the educational ones. Well, I, don't, I don't disagree with him, but so often what happens in economy debates and education debates in this parliament, we always look to something else that's just a little bit beyond our reach as the solution, rather than trying to tackle the real problem at the heart of it. And to me, I actually think this Parliament and this Government really needs to rise to the challenge of providing more nursery education, something that Malcolm Chisholm talked about, making sure that those from two years old upwards get good quality education, because that's the best way of changing their life chances, that creating that foundation. But secondly, targeting support. Two and a half billion pounds of support was channelled into the pupil premium south of the border, providing direct support 
for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds, rather than saying a whole area is deprived, focusing on the individuals and their individual support, making sure that they get the chance to get up and get on. So while I don't deny what Mark Macdonald says about those other factors in society, let's focus on the debate at hand here, rather than looking for reasons why we can't possibly act in the areas that they have uh, suggested. I would like to just finally conclude another remark um, that John Mason was making about the uh, when he was asking pupils as to how many were going to go into engineering. I'm, I'm a scientist myself and I want to see more people studying uh, STEM subjects. I think I'm also very keen to make sure we get a greater balance in the STEM subjects too. I think far too often we see women who go through um, higher education studying science just leaving that profession, choosing to go off and do uh, something else. We need to stop that stem. We need to stem that flow to make sure that they stay in the I'm science and close. engineering sector. That, for me, is fundamentally important to improving the skills and the opportunities for everybody across society. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Now, Colin Les Smith, maximum six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has actually been a very interesting debate, and I would particularly pick out very thoughtful speeches from Willie Rennie, Graham Pearson, Malcolm Chisholm, and John Mason, because I think there is agreement across the Chamber that this is the most important issue in education. And that's because the greatest gift that we give to any child is the ability to read, write, and count. And so I think it's naturally a very considerable concern when yet again we have seen laid bare the true facts, and I don't actually think it really matters which data we are using, because they're all pointing to exactly the same thing, that we do have an issue about literacy standards in uh, schools, and obviously there is a detrimental effect on the schools that many of these pupils take into the workplace, a workplace that is increasingly diverse and competitive. For us, I think there is particular concern uh, on two fronts. Firstly, in the past, and over a very long period of time, Scotland had a very proud record indeed when it came to school education for all pupils, and that was irrespective of their backgrounds, and most especially in the three R's. So I think the question has to be asked as to why we're not uh, being able to make the same progress that we ought to be, because I, for one, simply do not accept that pupils are less bright uh, than they were before. So it must be something else that is wrong. And secondly, despite all the initiatives, whether that's the Scottish Government's uh, Literacy Commission, uh, whether it's the Scottish Book Trust Initiative, whether it's the Play Talk Read, or, the, or indeed the Curriculum for Excellence uh, itself, we don't seem to be making the progress that we want to. Now, I know the Scottish Government will come back and say that it's too soon to judge the Curriculum for Excellence, and I have a little sympathy with that point of view. But what I cannot accept is the claim that there is something new uh, about all teachers being involved in teaching literacy, because as Malcolm Chisholm very rightly said, one of the reasons why Scottish education was admired around the world was precisely because teachers were very conscious of their role when it came to literacy, irrespective of their subject, and they were trained to do that. It's a point that was made in the Times Educational Supplement just last week, and it was also a point that I think was raised by the Literacy Commission, that perhaps we have to look at the teacher training programme again when it comes to literacy skills. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, in her speech last night, said that the government's education policy will be driven by evidence and not by dogma and not by ideology. And I, for one, am very pleased to hear that. But can we just remind ourselves of what the actual evidence has been as produced by members in this debate? The proportion of pupils performing well or very well in reading fell across all groups. In primary four, it dropped from 83% in 2012 to 78% in 2014. In writing, 72% of P7 pupils were doing very well or well in writing, but that fell to 68% in 2014. And in basic numeracy skills, 69% of P4s are doing well or very well, but that falls to only 42% in S2. Now, the Cabinet Secretary is right when she says that these statistics are simply not acceptable, and they are not, particularly after eight years in government. But let's continue the evidence base on the approach about what's wrong. Because for some long period of time now, most primary school teachers and heads have been saying that there needs to be a much more structured approach to literacy teaching, and one which has much more rigour when it comes to testing, reading, writing and arithmetic. They will tell you that situations where there is a tacit understanding that teachers will only use the tests when they feel that the pupil has reached the right level to pass do not actually work. They will tell you that there have been too many escape routes and it has been far too easy for there to be different approaches to testing in different parts of Scotland, a point that my colleague Mary Scanlon raised. 
Sometimes that has happened because heads or local authorities want to ensure that the timing of the test coincides with the publication of school's performance results. Or sometimes it's because there is a reluctance to apply the tests of uniform basis because there is a perception that they are too stressful an experience for many of the children. The critics sometimes tell you that formal testing makes pupils and their parents over anxious. Well, I suspect there will be a lot more anxiety if their son or daughter actually becomes one of the 9,000 pupils who still leave school unable to read or write properly. Teachers are highly professional people and they are perfectly capable of administering these tests properly and allaying the anxieties of pupils and parents. So I'm afraid I just do not accept these excuses. And that brings me, Deputy Presiding Officer, to our amendment about the change to the number of exams being sat. And there is a very, very important point here because there is a division in secondary education into the phase of broad general education and then there is the senior phase. And that is something that is very important when it comes to making subject choices because the new exams have meant that there is a decrease in the number of people, oh, sorry, the number of uh, subjects that are being available in S4. And in most schools, that has come down from eight to either seven or six. And ironically, that was done actually in the interest of promoting a broader educational experience in S1 to S3. But unsurprisingly, in the total presentations in S4, there is a decrease. Now, that's not to say that there are falling standards across the board, but what it does mean and what it will continue to mean, particularly to have an impact on higher and on advanced higher, is that the they, will have, to a close. They, they will have fewer qualifications when they leave school. And that is a concern that is um, impacting on colleges and on universities and parents and pupils find that something that the government has not yet been able to explain. So as I close, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a very serious issue. That's the reason why we have submitted this amendment. But on top of that, it is very much a concern about the overall standard of literacy, which, as the Cabinet Secretary has defined herself, simply isn't good enough. Many thanks. I now call on Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary, no more than eight minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I was very much looking forward to this debate this afternoon, um, given my uh, previous background in the youth employment brief. Uh, much of my work, a number of years now, has been spent supporting that connectivity between the world of work and the world of education. And the work I led on developing the young workforce is indeed work uh, and an agenda that I remain deeply committed to. We're now seeing youth unemployment the lowest it's been in seven years but make no mistake about it, we still have a lot to do in terms of both our economy and in terms of education, in terms of addressing uh, systemic and uh, structural youth unemployment. Now, presiding officer, um, depending on your perspective... Uh, briefly, thanks. Dr Simpson. I wonder if that out of 3,767 looked-after children, only 20% were in fact in employment, education or training after leaving care. Cabinet Secretary. No, I am most certainly not, Mr Simpson. And, you know, one of the uh, themes throughout all of the work that we do in this chamber and in education in particular has to be focused firmly on looked after children. And we'll come back to, to more of that, I hope, in the government debate that we'll have um, next week. President Officer, um, depending on your perspective, um, this debate has either been spirited or ill-tempered. Um, and we have heard, of course, the more considered tones of the likes of Malcolm Chisholm um, and Claire Adamson, and I think that was appreciated by all. And I know that many members have spoke about uh, Labour's table uh, and Dr uh, Scott's data. And I only want to reiterate something very, very quickly because there are other substantive issues that I do want to respond to. The number of people achieving qualifications at levels three to five did not fall by 20%. Uh, between 2013 and 2014, it fell by around 6% due to less pupils in S4, less presentations at S3, and curriculum for excellences focus on fewer subjects uh, in more depth. And I do have to say to um, Liz Smith that fewer qualifications in S4 will not lead to fewer qualifications at S5 and S6. And I think that's something that the university sector have also uh, reiterated and supported. 
maybe later, but what I want to say, just um, for clarity, I will certainly put full information of the government's analysis in SPICE um, of the issues in and around uh, Dr uh, Scott's data, and no doubt it is an issue uh, that we may well uh, return to, because I do want to uh, focus on the substantive um, issues that were indeed raised by many members. Willie Rennie spoke about the, the pupil premium. It is something that I have looked very carefully at, and I will continue to look at interventions that provide a more targeted approach and that are about getting resources and services to the children most in need and that are about supporting those eh, on the front line. And in essence, that was the philosophy eh, underpinning eh, the Scottish Attainment Challenge flexible funds that could be used to support kids most in need and those eh, on the front line. But I suppose what I'm also saying to, to Mr Rennie is that some of the evidence around the pupil premium, I think, has been less than clear, eh, such as that from the, the Commission eh, of Social Mobility, eh, which said that the money was often used to alleviate cuts from elsewhere eh, and it didn't always get to the children eh, most in need. But I do want to assure him that I share his high aspirations eh, for all our children and we will continue to look at how better to target resources, building on a strong platform of a universal uh, support. I can also say to Liz Smith uh, she is right to uh, focus on uh, literacy and numeracy and its central place uh, in our curriculum. I think we'll come back to that more in detail next week. And while I will say that most children are performing well, or very well, we can see that in eight out of 10 children in terms of reading. But there is no doubt that there was a decrease uh, in the survey results for 2012 to 2014, and we can't have that. So we do need to uh, redouble our efforts. And through various debates and parliamentary questions, I have spoken at length about the work that we have undertaken over the past year and what we're doing to redouble our efforts uh, now. I can also say to uh, Mary Scanlon, who I think very eloquently raised some of the concerns uh, that parents have, uh, none of that, uh, what she raised, was, was new to me. Um, but I do have to remind her, and I don't say this by way of apportioning blame, I say it by way of fact, that local authorities have statutory responsibilities to deliver education. They have that operational uh, responsibility for many of the matters uh, that she raises. But what I will say is that the point about having comparable data, uh, data that allows us to track and monitor individual children, to know what's working, to know what's not working, and to know what we need to do to make a difference in the here and now is absolutely needed. And I said in my speech uh, last night, I echoed the words uh, of uh, Sue Ellis, another uh, academic, that we do need to have a national debate about the sensible use uh, of information and data, and that will be very important to have the right information not pointless information that, that we don't need. We don't want to increase that bureaucratic burden, but we need to have the right information about individual children at a local authority level and at a national level. And some of the work in and around the national improvement uh, framework is about bringing all that together. Briefly, presiding officer, can I say I make no apologies for investing £51 million into the protection uh, of teacher numbers. Uh, I am very proud of the fact that we have a graduate workforce, uh, professional teachers, first-class teachers, and I don't want to see uh, numbers of teachers uh, within our system uh, fall any further. And what, but the important point, the important point is, of course. Uh, Teacher numbers have stabilised uh, since 2011 at uh, around 50,000, 51,000. But what I will say, in, no, not quite just yet, in the action that we took earlier in this year in reaching a new agreement with our partners in local uh, government, if we find that structures, if we find that funding methodologies are standing in the way of doing what's right to ensure our children get the best education, well, indeed, there is absolutely nothing off the table. Now, presiding officer, I think it is very important to both shine a light on the successes of Scottish education, as well as giving a very honest evaluation of what we're not getting right. And our biggest priority is indeed the attainment challenge. That gap between children from the least and most deprived communities, and we need to, to do more in terms of literacy and numeracy. But we should also say that we do have considerable success in our school system. We have reduced further and faster the proportion 
proportion of young people leaving school with low or no qualifications. But of course, we want young people to be leaving with the highest level of qualifications. And we have increased the proportion of young people leaving school uh, with the minimal qualifications at SCQF5. But we need to be aiming high and aiming high for all our children. And unlike Labour, we did halt the decline in our international standing when you look at PISA. And we perform well in maths and you know, are above average in terms of reading and science. Can but, the reality, you must is, close, but the reality is uh, we are still middle ranking and that indeed is what we have to, to, to change. And what I will very briefly say to Jackie Bailey and Willie Rennie who said that we should focus on the powers that we do have and indeed I'll pick up on that point that Mark Macdonald also but made. I'm afraid it must I be agree, brief. Cabinet but we'll Secretary. always argue for more but but I just want to end by saying, President Officer, and uh, thank you, is that uh, while we will do everything in our powers to eradicate poverty, it will never, ever be an excuse for failure. Thank you very much. And now call on Ian Gray to wind up the debate. Ten minutes, please, Mr Gray. Thank you, uh, President Officer. The um, uh, attainment in our schools isn't the only link between the economy and economic growth uh, and uh, education. Uh, one would expect in a country like this with... Uh, our whole history built on skills, knowledge and inventiveness, uh, a country which still has many world-class edu educational institutions. Uh, one would expect that a government that had been in power for eight years would have uh, a worked out economic strategy and at the core of it, uh, it would have the idea of leveraging that excellent research into new knowledge-based jobs, pushing our industries ever further up the skills chain in order to compete in a globalising world. The truth is that we have a government with an, econo an economic stra strategy which amounts simply to the imaginary benefits of hypothetical powers. Uh, a, a, an economic strategy which posits the idea that co constitutional change in and of itself would automatically lead to growth rates unprecedented in our history and indeed the history of the Western world. Indeed, not only do we not have that strategy, we don't even have support for the kind of strategy that we need. We've seen in recent times cuts to the Global Ex uh, Excellence Fund supporting exactly the kind of research we need to see in our universities uh, in order to create jobs through commercialisation. We saw the abolition of the intermediary technology institutes and they've been replaced with the innovation centres uh, tasked with creating 5,000 jobs uh, in five years. Now, two years in, as far as I can see, the only jobs they have created are the 65 within the centres themselves. But much of our debate, all of our debate, really has focused on uh, schools and attainment. And I think that is because we do agree across the chamber the, on the economic importance of unleashing the potential of our people. And the truth is, if we fail to equip our young people for their futures, uh, our greatest shame is that we blight their lives. But perhaps the greatest price we pay uh, will be the price of economic failure. And that is outlined most tellingly in the OECD uh, report. And I, I say to Mr Brodie, I think it was, the report doesn't refer to Scotland particularly, but the numbers are so dramatic that I think we can draw our own conclusions from it. It says that in the UK, if all youngsters could reach a basic skills level by 2030, that would add £2.3 trillion to the nation's economy. So uh, we know that in Scotland uh, we, we have the attainment gap. We know that our youngsters are not all reaching the basic skills level. So we must know that the impact on our economy is also dramatic. So although uh, the greatest failure uh, in our problems with literacy and numeracy is the moral failure of letting down uh, those children, particularly those from poorer backgrounds. It is also something which matters for our economy. Uh, and we see uh, from the government's own literacy survey that we are making no progress in this, no progress in reducing the attainment gap, any fall in literacy levels at all levels for uh, all uh, uh, economic uh, uh, details as well. And we saw last year that in numeracy exactly the same situation prevails. And I understand that the government and the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge this, and she has today. But what she cannot do is somehow declare this as year zero, yeah. as if they were starting all over. Yeah. Last night, 
The Cabinet Secretary told local government they must own their own attainment gap. Well, I say to the Cabinet Secretary, she must own her government's own record for the past eight years. And look, I'm not saying that the SNP government have done nothing in schools for the past eight years. They introduced curriculum for excellence. And for the avoidance of doubt, we support the principles of curriculum for excellence. We began their development. But the implementation of curriculum for excellence has been entirely the work of the Scottish National Party. And for years, teachers, head teachers, educationalists, parents have been warning that there are problems. And Jim Scott's figures are only the latest alarm bell which has been sounded about the impact both of CFE itself, but also of the new national exams and the way that they have been introduced. And I regret the Cabinet Secretary's, I think, rather patronising and foolish attempt to debunk both those statistics and the credibility of Dr Scott as a researcher today. The statistics that we've discussed today were made available last week, and they clearly show a 12% drop in the number of exams which were sat and a 20% drop in those who were passed. No, just a minute, I'm going to come to uh, you, I think, Mr Stevenson, in a second. And I say to the Cabinet Secretary, Dr Scott was a teacher pretty well all his working life. He was the head teacher of four different schools. He is an education research fellow. He knows the difference between the number of pupils and the number of candidates. And we have been very careful to say this shows 102,000 fewer candidates. That means individuals sitting on individual exam. And yes, some of that is explained by the fact that candidates are doing fewer exams. We know that. But, uh, as uh, I think it was Mary Scanlon said, many parents were told their young people could still do eight subjects. Many were told they had to do only five and this is something which has been left to individual schools. There is a problem here, both in the reduction in the number of enrolments and in the attainment. And I say to Mr Stewart and to Stuart Stevenson, uh, the statisticians uh, of our company who would like to examine these statistics, these statistics are, are summarised from the SQA post-review statistics which were published in December. They are there. If you haven't got round to counting them up and normalising them, then I'm sorry, but Jim Scott has, and we're not entitled to ignore it. No, I'm sorry. And, and then, of course, the Cabinet Secretary said that uh, we still have pupils... Uh, uh, it, the, the attempt, sorry, she answered these statistics with outcomes from pupils who, of course, have not sat the new... Uh, national exams. She would be well advised, in my view, to try and sort out the problem here instead of trying to fix the figures. And she has to understand that there are two problems here. That the education system that she is privileged to hold has traditionally been highly regarded for being both broad and high quality. And these statistics show it is narrowing and declining. And that is a problem to which she must turn her mind. And on attainment, I acknowledge too that she has acted and introduced the attainment fund. And we welcome this investment and I continue to welcome that investment. But I do reserve the right to scrutinise the way in which that investment is being made. And she talked about the attainment advisors, the core of the attainment challenge. We've ex had exchanges about this before, where it became clear that she did not know how many attainment advisors there were going to be. She thought there was going to be 12. The First Minister thought she was going to be 32. Now we think there is going to be one for every local authority. But again, Mary Scanlon is right. Here's the advert. We don't know if they're for two years. We don't know if they're for 12 years. They might be part-time. They might be full-time. We don't know how many there are. And the best or the worst thing about it is that they are all secondments. We are going to take the best teachers out of the schools 
and put them in a local authority office. That isn't the way to address the attainment gap. The truth is, the way to address the attainment gap is to have more teachers, to have more teaching assistants so teachers can teach, and more literacy and numeracy specialists working with families as well as the youngest children. And that's why we've suggested additional action of exactly this kind over and above the government's programme. And yes, it was based on the introduction of a 50p tax rate, which won't Mr. happen Gray. quickly now. But perhaps we could agree, perhaps this is something we could agree on, that given the opportunity, we would tax the better off and use it to start to close this attainment gap we have debated all afternoon. Because the truth is this. The truth is this. How much we care about this will be demonstrated by how much we are willing to in invest. And that is why the education record of a Scottish Government which cut education spending when even the Tories in England were increasing it falls short and lets down our young people and Scotland itself. That concludes the debate on the future of Scotland's economy. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13227 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the timetabling of stage one of the Scottish elections reduction of voting age bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13227. Formally moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the motion to the, que the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13227, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13212, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. On behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now, and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13212. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13212, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of four parliamentary business motions. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions number 13213 to 13216, setting out stage one and stage two timetables for various bills on block? Moved on block. I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 13213 to 13216, if any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected to a single question being put. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13213 to 13216, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13216 on approval of an SSI. Um, moving 13218. My apologies. Well spotted. Uh, it is, of course, motion number 13218 on approval of an SSI that the Minister of Parliamentary Business has moved. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to this afternoon's debate, if the amendment in the name of Angela Constance is agreed to, the amendments in the name of Mary Scanlon and Willie Rennie fall. The first question then is amendment number 13203.3 in the name of Angela Constance, which seeks to amend motion number 13203 in the name of Jackie Bailey on the future of Scotland's economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. How could you operate it?
the result of the vote on Amendment Number 13203.3 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 54. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to, and the amendments in the name of Mary Scanlon and Willie Rennie fall. The next question is at motion number 13203 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended. On the future of Scotland's economy, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13203 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 53. There were, no, there were four abstentions, so the motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 13218 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We are now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.